So, hi teachers, if you've joined me already, we're just waiting for a few more people to join and uh, we're going to get started very shortly. There is a slight delay, so if you write something in the chat box and I don't reply to it straight away on the video, don't worry about it, I will get to you. Uh, it's just a slight delay coming up on my screen. But I am going to try and keep track of everyone and um, I'm excited to get started. We'll be getting started in a few minutes. So Christy has already joined in and she said hello from New Jersey. She's not teaching today. I'm not teaching today either, Christy, which is really fun. We have a two week break at the moment here in Ireland. So um, I've been off for the past nine or 10 days or so. And I'm back to teaching this Sunday. I have some extra classes to do and then back to full teaching schedule on Monday. So, um, we're both lucky we're both off this evening, which is great. And Johnny, I think Hilliard says hi from Mississippi as well. So really fun. Two different teachers in different parts of the States. So if you are watching and you haven't already said hi, please say hi in the comments and I will get to you. I've just had another one in there. I'm Heather in Canada. I have a light day today, five private lessons and one group lesson. That doesn't sound that light to me. Uh, Heather, on a normal day, I might have eight or nine. So that sounds pretty, pretty intense still to me, like a lot going on. But in most parts of the world where you're watching, I think it's the morning time. So you're probably all, uh, doing some household things, maybe getting a little bit of relaxing in and um, getting ready to start teaching, which is awesome. Labshi, no, no name, just a username, says hi from Germany, which is really fun one lesson today spring break so it must be a makeup lesson or something like that if you're still teaching on spring break and we have dorla in texas teaching this afternoon which is fun i know in the states some of you had spring break um even two weeks ago or three weeks ago right whereas it's the same all over ireland kimberly says hi from PA, I can't remember where that is. <laughs> Pennsylvania, is it? Anyway, wherever you are, Kimberly, welcome. You're very welcome here. We're going to get started in just a few minutes, just giving the last few people a chance to join us. I don't want to start early on them and exclude them. And Gail says, hi from Canada. It's 11 a.m. teaching at 3 to 8.15. That sounds like my standard schedule, Gail. And Cara in Alberta says hello as well. Wonderful. Two Canadians on so far. No, three Canadians on so far. And one fellow European <laughs> from Germany. Okay, so it's four on the button. I'm going to give them just two more minutes to join. Um, but don't worry, I won't waste your time. We're just going to give them another minute to join in and say hi and tell us about their teaching schedules. And then we're going to get started with the presentation. I've got some really fun practice strategies prepared for you.
Okay, so it's just gone two minutes past four here in Ireland and I like to get things started on time. I'm a very punctual person, so I'm going to jump in and get started with the presentation. Now, when I jump into the presentation, you won't be able to see me anymore. Um, I'm in my home office, which is in the garden. So if you hear strange noises above or anything like that, um, that's just the helicopters flying overhead, <laughs> which seems to have been circling around today. Um, and you may hear dogs barking and stuff like that, but um, I, I'm afraid I can't completely mute the world. And we're better off out here with the tech setup. So I'm going to jump into that presentation now. So soon you'll be able to see my screen all going well. Okay, so I have it set up so that I can still see your chat. So please do ask questions as we go through. I'm excited to have you all here and watching. And if you have questions as we go through, write them in the chat box. I'll try to get to them when we can. Like I said, there is a slight delay. So if I don't answer you immediately, don't worry, I will get to you. And I will make sure to go back and check for all the questions at the end. Hmm, not positive that this is showing up okay. Just one second there. Okay, so Christine says, there it is. I think that's Christine. There it is. So hopefully you're able to see my screen right now. Okay, it's showing up on mine now too. Maybe I won't go into full full screen. I don't think it like that. So we'll just leave that menu bar up the top. So welcome. I hope you're ready to get started. Um, and we're going to learn about five different practice strategies. So let's get started. First, a little bit about me. So my name is Nicola Canton. Um, I'm a piano teacher in Dublin, Ireland, hence the accent, um, if you were wondering about that. I'm the author of a book called The Piano Practice Physician's Handbook, which just came out about a month ago now. And I also blog at colorfulkeys.ie and I have the Vibrant Music Studio Teachers Community on Facebook. Um, so that's where most people will know me from is the blog, I'd say, or the Facebook community. But I wear many different hats and they all have one thing in common, which is uh, they're all about sharing my passion for creative, inclusive and forward thinking piano teaching. So I don't think we need to be stuck in the past and I think we need to have a lot of fun when we're teaching. And that's what everything I do is all about. In today's workshop, we're going to be looking at five different strategies. These strategies are for fixing students playing too fast. So speeding ahead, which I know we've all experienced. Um, particular rhythm issues. So we're going to be dealing with one rhythm issue in particular. Um, misunderstandings when it comes to note reading. So students who have a particular problem with a certain aspect of the grand staff, students who play from the beginning every single time, um, which I know a lot of them do and it's uh, not so beneficial, and the fluctuating tempo, so students who change tempo in the middle of the piece. There is a free printable download at the end, I'll give you the link to that, for all the strategies, so you don't have to 
remember them. You're welcome to take notes, but you don't have to remember all the details. There are printables that you can give to your students and for them to practice at home and for you to remember the stuff in the lesson. So I'll give you that link at the very end. Stay tuned for that. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please speak up. Write them in the chat box. I'll be delighted to get to them at the end if I don't get a chance to answer them as we go. Um, I'd love to answer them at the end, so I will save time for that. Please write them as you think of them. Feel free to write anything that comes into your mind in the chat box and I'll get back to you. Now, so why am I so passionate about this whole piano practice thing and being efficient with piano practice? Well, students spend only 1% of their week with you, if that. So if they take 30 minute lessons, that's much less than 1% of their week that they spend with you. Their parents may not know anything about music. Even if they are educated musically, even if they understand music reading or they learned when they were a child, they probably don't remember how practice looked and they probably don't know about how their child should be practicing or understand everything that their child is doing. But our students need to practice and they need to practice well. They need to practice carefully and constructively. So we need to teach them during that tiny little 1%, less than 1% sliver of the week, what to practice during the other 99% of their week so that they can make real progress because we all know that practice time is when the progress really happens. There's very little that can happen in only half an hour a week or even 45 minutes or so. We're gonna look at these five strategies today. Each one of those should be done together first. So you're practicing together in the lesson then get your student to reiterate it back to you. So get them to tell you how it went, how it worked, and what the procedure is. Don't just repeat it to them and let it fall on deaf ears. Make sure to ask them to explain it to you. Then you give them sheets or instructions to practice at home. And then the next week you revisit and you repeat as many times as it need for these practice strategies to become sort of embedded so that they're just a natural thing that your students are doing and they're no longer conscious. But it does take a lot of repetitions to get these really ingrained as habits. Okay, into the main body of the presentation. This is the first cure that I have to share with you from the Piano Practice Physicians Clinic my course. So this is at sixes and sevens. This uh, cure is for start again syndrome, which comes from my book and my course um, all around the piano physician. So the start again syndrome is what I call the students who start at the beginning every single time they play. So when they do this, the first few bars, the first few me measures are better than the rest of the piece, which is a pain and it gradually deteriorates. So if they're performing the piece, then what people remember is the poor ending. And they also aren't able to pick up after mistakes because they can't start anywhere except the beginning. Um, so they aren't able to start in the middle. If they make a mistake in the middle, they have to go back to the beginning again. So what's the ex sixes and sevens cure? This cure is very simple. You write the numbers one to six on the music at strategic spots. So if any of this is unclear as I'm going, please do write in the chat box. I'm still keeping an eye on it. So we write these numbers one to six on the music, directly on the music, at strategic spots, as I say. So don't write it, say, if there's a thumb over, don't write it at the two that went over the thumb. You know, don't make it in awkward places. Make sure it's somewhere that's going to be easy to start at. 
and that makes some kind of sense harmonically or musically or melodically and fingering wise especially so you have your numbers one to six written in and then you roll the die very simple say it says three we start at section three and we play from there until the end don't play just section three this is the whole point they're going to be practicing the end more than the beginning if we do it this way I think you can see why I've set it up this way. It means that section six gets practiced the most, no matter what they roll. If they roll a six, they practice just section six. Wonderful. If they roll a one, they practice the whole piece. Then we keep track of these sections as we're practicing them in the tracking chart, which again, I'll give you in the PDF download at the very end. So stay tuned and I'll give you that link. And there's a chart there where the student can keep track of this at home. They repeat it seven times, seven different places. And they practice it that way every day. It's a perfect way to practice. It's wonderful even if your student doesn't have uh, start again syndrome, but it's especially useful when they do and when they've let it really set into a piece. So that's the sixes and sevens cure. Now, the next one is the C reorientation. This is maybe a little bit less common, but I've certainly seen plenty of students with this problem. This is the cure for octave disorientation. Octave disorientation is my funny fancy name for when students get confused about which octave they should be playing in. So they see a middle C and they play a bass C or vice versa, or they see a high C and they play a low C. They're just not associating the notes with a particular note on the piano, a particular key. They just see, they are fine with note names. They can see that it's a C, but they don't play the correct C. I find this happens a lot with some of my transfer students. Um, that come to me maybe from a questionable method book and maybe it's just some disassociation that's happened somewhere along the line. It's hard to tell why it happens all the time, but once it sets in, it can be very persistent. It can also be caused by um, students who practice on a not full length keyboard. So even some weighted keyboards are actually only a C to a C. They don't go from the A up to the C. Um, so everything looks different when they come from their lesson and it just throws them. To do the C reorientation, you want to draw six C's. I've included the middle C twice, so six C's at the start of your student's music. You draw them just after the time signature in the clef. And then once they're drawn in, I like to do them in a nice bright color, but you can do them in pencil if it needs to be neat. Once they're drawn in, ask your student to find each one. First, ask them to start at the bottom. So ask them to find the low C, then the bass C, then the middle C, and then the treble C, and then the high C. And once they've done that, start pointing to them randomly and jumping around and ask them, them to play each one on the piano as you go. So you're really drilling into exactly where each of those C's are. Then once they've really got a handle on where the C's are, oh, I just seen Catherine from Singapore has just joined us. So that's wonderful. Another um, part of the world represented there. Someone from Asia joining in, which is fantastic. She stayed up late for it. So those C reorientations, once they've got a handle on where the C's are, then you broach the actual music. So up to this point, you haven't talked about anything that they're actually playing in their song. You just talked about those Cs. And then you talk about the first notes in the music. So you'll see in the example here in the picture, we have a low E there. So we would ask them what that note is. They'll probably name it correctly. If they've no problem with the note names, they tell us it's an E. Fantastic. Which of those Cs is the closest to then? And they find that C on the piano. And then you say, okay, well, if that's closest to the low C, 
Where's the closest E to that? And that's your starting place. Make sure you go through this procedure with each of the starting notes. And that way they can find their place reliably at home. You may need to do it several times, but no problem. Then in the middle of their piece, if there is a place where they move or they seem to always lose their place, draw the C's again at that spot right there so they can see the relationship and then repeat the same procedure. You don't have to go through all the C drilling, but ask them what the notes are at that point. Okay, and which landmark notes are they closest to and go through it that way. This just allows students to have a particular system that they know works to figure out where they where they go. Because some students with this octave disorientation, they just have no action plan. They have no game plan when it comes to figuring out where they should actually be playing on the piano. So this gives a reliable method, stick with it, use it every single time that they have this issue. And eventually they'll be able to imagine those Cs, but it's a great crutch for them to use for now. And it works really well. Okay, our next cure is the become a lyricist cure. This is something you might be familiar with. These students, this is a cure for students with what I call beam fever. Now beam fever is when students see quavers or semi quavers even, eighth notes or 16th notes, anything with a beam, and they just think, okay, fast. <laughs> Quaver equals fast. I'll go as fast as I possibly can. And they're not really feeling the rhythm and they don't understand it. A lot of the time this happens with young students, I find, because they don't actually understand fractions yet. And they've been told that quavers are half a crotchet or half a beat or whatever. And that doesn't mean anything to them because, yes, you can slice an orange in half and show them, but really they haven't encountered fractions in school. So it's not going to sink in in the way that we want them to. And they're not going to fully comprehend that idea. So become a lyricist attempts to make this more musical and less mathematical. Now I'm sure you've all, or a lot of you, have done this kind of thing before setting words to the rhythm to try and help your students with a tricky rhythm. I do want you to stay with me though because I think the particular procedure here is important. So what I want you to do is first clap the rhythm together just without any counting, without ta's and tt's or whatever you use, clap the rhythm together, clap it first and ask them to clap along with you. And then until that they really are getting it exactly with you. Okay, then ask them to come up with words that fit. They may do this straight away. Some students just immediately say, oh, that sounds like a unicorn went to the river or something. They just immediately come up with something funny that fits. If they don't or they're a bit shy about it, no problem. Ask them for their favorite food, their favorite hobby, anything like that, and use that to come up with a rhythm that fits and that they can have some ownership of because they came up with the theme of it. Then write these lyrics onto the music just write them directly where lyrics would go underneath the treble clef and above the bass clef and then clap and say the lyrics together and then play and say the lyrics so there's a lot of steps involved it's very one step at a time and then at the end they're playing and saying the lyrics now i have said playing and saying the lyrics if they immediately go for singing then that's fine but i do find that saying them actually helps more because they can kind of chant it in the rhythm and they don't tend to alter it with the way they used to be playing the rhythm. So I find it helpful if they play and say rather than play and sing the lyrics. Our next cure is the reverse metronome ladder. This is a cure for vivace influenza. Now, in my book, The Piano Practice Physician's Handbook, I differentiate between vivace influenza and presto infatuation. The difference being students with vivace influenza 
are the ones that really have trouble playing slowly. So these aren't the students who just don't want to play slowly. That's a different, a different ailment, a different practice issue in my book. These are the students who just have trouble playing slowly. It may be that they're doing the rhythm or the melody a little bit by ear and that when they slow down, it doesn't make sense to them because they can't grasp onto anything. So they need a step-by-step -step process for playing with more care and for slowing themselves down. So the reverse metronome ladder might be what you expect it to be. First, we choose a tempo that your student can play at with the, with the metronome, whatever that is. You may need to do this section by section if they can't do the whole piece, that's no problem at all. But pick a tempo that they can play something at successfully. Then we repeat this section with the tempo getting three or five BPM lower each time. So you'll see there on the chart that I have in the picture, we have day two, it starts at 95, then 92, 89, 86, 83. So it's going down in threes each time. We take a note of the tempo on this chart and you'll be able to get this chart in the PDF at the end of the presentation. So we take note of the tempo on this chart and then the next day, this is the key thing, the next day we start at the second last tempo. So by the end of the week, they are going to be playing so slowly. And this may seem counterintuitive to them, it may even seem counterintuitive to you, but they're going to know that section or that piece so much better by the end of that week. Because they have to take extreme care to play that slowly and to slow down that much and stay with the metronome. They have to really know where everything fits, what all their notes are, what all their fingerings are to be able to do this. And it's very helpful for those students who just aren't confident playing slowly and therefore they're not practicing slowly. So they've never learned how beneficial it is and seen the results that they can get from it. Okay, we're into our last of our five practice strategies. This last one is called hands off. This is a cure for what I call tempo shivers. This is when students um, have these spots where they slow down the tempo. So they go fast, 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 and then slows down, and then it picks up again straight after that tricky bit. These students aren't taking care to really work on the tricky spots, and they're not thinking clearly about them attention to what the problem really is. They don't necessarily see that there is a problem with um, slowing down in this section. They may not even know they're doing it, but it's very disconcerting uh, for the listener. Okay, so to do hands off, as you might have guessed, tell your student to place her hands in her lap. She is not going to play straight away. Then start to ask her some questions about that tricky bit. So ask her what the fingering is, what the notes are, about the harmony, what chords are involved, are there cadences, are there scale passages, whatever it is that actually features in that tricky spot and wherever your student is up to in terms of their theory knowledge. But you'll know the questions to ask based on what you're dealing with. There's a list of sample questions so you can get an idea in that PDF at the end of the presentation. After you've asked her these questions, ask her to play it once so she can put her hands back on the piano and she can play the section once. Then take away the music so she can't see it and ask her more questions about the same spot. Throughout this process, you will come up with questions that she just didn't understand or didn't grasp or hadn't remembered. And these are the things that you want to write at the top of her music on a post-it, something like that, that she can ask herself at home or that her parents can ask her if she's younger. Um, so before playing the piece, she'll have these hands-off questions. Okay, hands in lap. I ask myself all of these questions about those tricky, tricky spots in my piece. 
and then I get started playing. So this gives her a way to, a methodical way to think about the theory behind the piece before she starts playing. Okay, so those are our five practice strategies. Stay with me for that PDF. But what if you need more practice strategies and you want to solve more practice issues without getting a headache, <laughs> which I know all of us have had from students doing the same thing over and over. Well, um, my course, the Piano Practice Physicians Clinic, could be the answer. So let me show you what it's about and you can see if it's a good fit for you. Why have I chosen a piano practice physician's clinic, first of all? Why did I choose this analogy of a doctor and a clinic? I think it encourages you to, to be analytic and thoughtful, to think about and analyze your student's practice rather than just lamenting or fretting about it. It keeps you focused on the cure for your student's practice issues. And it prevent, because it keeps you focused on the cure, it prevents the teacher and the student stressing about stuff. So when you're focused on finding a solution and getting to the heart of the problem with the practice, it just gives you this positive spin. Instead of getting all negative and, oh, Johnny won't play his sharps in his piece or whatever he's not doing right, you think about what is really causing that problem and can I find the solution for it? And yes, you can, because it's all detailed in this course. It takes the focus away from more practice and puts it on better practice. I see too many incentives and charts and stuff, which I use too, but when we incentivize all this extra practice, we put so much focus on that, and we hardly ever focus on making the practice time that they do have better. And we all know how student, how busy our students are these days. You know, they've got homework pressures and school tests and tons of extracurricular activities. So they need to be able to make the best possible use of their time. And this will lead to more job satisfaction for you. It's more enjoyable as a teacher to be able to focus on curing these practice issues and with these sort of, as you've seen, kind of gamified ways of curing them. So it's more fun for you as a teacher and it's more fun for your students and they're gonna stick around longer because every lesson is kind of an adventure in figuring out what the issue is underlying what they're doing and how they can practice that more effectively with these different strategies and techniques and fun ways to practice. How is the course structured? It's split into six different parts. If you've read my little handbook, it's the same structure. So we've got six parts. The first one is chronic ailments. These are the bad practice habits, such as start again syndrome, which we looked at today. We've got fevers and chills. These are problems with tempo. So too fast, like we looked at today, too slow, uneven tempos, that kind of thing. Heart palpitations are the rhythm and beat issues such as beam fever. Vision impairment is the inattention to notation. So dynamics, accidentals, other markings, that kind of thing that they're not paying attention to. They're only looking at the notes. So it's everything but the notes. Ear infections are the musical insensitivity. So students lacking emotion when they play and struggling with pitch recognition, that kind of thing. And the last, part of the course is all about aches and pains, so technique issues, problems with different techniques such as getting students to curve their fingertips, stop having floppy fingertips or keeping their wrists up, that kind of thing. There are 98 videos in to total, but don't worry, it's not totally overwhelming. I have on purpose made these videos nice and bite-sized. So each video is maybe two or three minutes and it just gives you that shot of exactly what to do. I detail exactly how you use the practice strategy, what it's for or what the practice issue is that we're dealing with and why it's important. And you could literally watch one of these 
just after you finish teaching, over your coffee break, when a student is late, that kind of thing. So you can squeeze them into your day because I know we're all busy. And it also makes it easier to jump back to a video if you think, oh, I had, there was that idea about that. And you can immediately look it up, watch it in two minutes and remember what it was that you needed to do to cure that practice problem. There's also a workbook included that you can use to take action straight away, keep track of which ones would be useful for which student, and also keep track of questions you want to ask because throughout the course, you are welcome to ask questions. There is a private community, a private forum, where you can ask questions that I'll answer and other teachers will answer. And we talk about everything piano practice related. This course has been up for just about just over a week or so, two weeks almost maybe, um, at this beta membership price. It's only a beta membership because I wanted to make sure that all the tech was up and running and working fantastically before I let everyone in. But all the content has been there the whole time. I wouldn't ask you to pay for something if the content wasn't already there. All the 98 videos are there and the PDF downloads and the workbook and the forms are all set up and ready to go. There's only a few hours left to get this beta membership because the tech is all fine. There's been no issues. So if you wanna get in at that price, you need to act fast. I'm leaving it open just for you guys that are watching today, just to give you a chance to get in at the less than half price beta membership. It's going up to 97 in just a few hours. So if you wanna check out the course, go to pianophysician.com slash course. Okay, so that freebie, you can get it at pianophysician.com slash awesome. That's where you'll find the PDF with all the strategies that I detail today. I really hope you enjoy using them and get a lot out of them and that they improve your pra students' practice habits in a way that's fun and enjoyable for you as a teacher and fun and uh, gives you your student lots of giggles too. So that's pianophysician.com slash awesome awesome enter your de details there and i'll send you the pdf right away okay if you've got any questions please write them in the chat box i'm going to stick around for a few minutes to make sure i answer everyone and i'm going to go back to people's questions now so let's see i have a question here from ket from Chong, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, how do you encourage students to develop the discipline to practice consistently? Like the chart you created for them for five days on the tempo changes. Okay, well, this is a big question. First of all, if they are under, say, 11, it is not their job to develop this practice habit. It is their job in conjunction with their parents. <laughs> they absolutely have to have their parents involved if they're going to remember to practice. And this is something that I set up from the first interview, the first time students come into my studio. I will explain to the parents what their role is, not in a strict way, but this is how you get the most out of piano lessons. This is what is going to be the most beneficial for your child in piano lessons and um, it is your job just like they need to brush their teeth you need to set up this practice habit now i do have several um different incentives on my blog that i can direct you to one is called the 100 days um practice sorry i got distracted julia wanted me to show that link again so i'm just going to flip that back and julia can grab that it's pianophysician.com awesome so on my blog you'll find practice incentives such as 100 days of practice that kind of thing but i think the main thing is that the parents need to be involved and the students need to see progress so if they are wasting a ton of their practice time and not using effective practice strategies they're not going to find that inbuilt discipline to continue because they don't have the reward. And really the reward with piano is always gonna be getting to play awesome music. So their music needs to be fun. 
and they need to be able to make good progress towards it. If they don't see the progress from their practice, they're not going to keep practicing because there's no intrinsic motivation to do so. I hope that helps get, make sure to write another question if you want further clarification there. Uh, Sandra said she's already purchased my book. Thank you, Sandra. That's much appreciated. Um, you can... Okay, Julia's off, but she's got the link, which is great. Um, yes, yeah, so Sandra's already purchased the book. You can get that at pianophysician.com. There's links to everything, um, Amazon, Kobo, Nook, all the places that you might find it. Uh, Forte Piano Studio. Oh, he's had a problem accessing that link. Okay, I will have to check on that. If you do also have trouble plugging some, getting the details to go through, please check back and I'll um, I'll sort that out if there is a problem with that. Can't do it right now uh, while I'm live, but uh, I'll check. And if there is a problem, just check back in a few hours and I'll get that sorted. Tech, 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 tech. Musically Inclined says, thank you so much for the webinar. Very helpful. Oh, and J and M Savo. Oh, I know that name. Can't think who that is. It's obviously two people sharing an account. Um, says it worked for them so hopefully it's working for most people Ket says sounds great most students get caught up with schoolwork so there are a lot of excuses not to practice yes there always are going to be excuses not to practice i think the most beneficial thing for my students is tying it to something else so either it happens straight after homework or it happens before school some of them get up early before school especially if they're on the 100 days of practice, that really convinces them to get up before school and get it in, which is great. Um, and yeah, tying it to something. So tie it to when mum is making dinner or, you know, as soon as dad gets in from work, whatever it is. I know some parents practice with their kids immediately after they get in from work um, or... Kids will do it even before they have lunch, when they get home from school, that kind of thing. I think it's good to tie it to another activity. CEO says, how many hours are you leaving for the special membership? It's currently one in the morning, Sydney time. Yes, <laughs> if you want to go to bed, that's no problem. Um, just get up in the morning and check it. I will leave it for maybe at least a few hours, I might leave it for about 12 hours just to make absolutely sure that you've had a chance to grab it. So if you need to hop to bed, please do and check in as soon as you get up in the morning and it should still be fine. Otherwise, it's going up to 97. It's still a great deal. Like I say, it's 98 videos, so it's less than a dollar a video um, and it is action packed and there's that community. Um, Forte Piano Studio, I think that's Paul My well, it might be a different Forte Piano Studio, but if it is Paul, hi Paul. Um, it worked, I just didn't re receive any confirmation on the web page. Okay, so it just didn't load properly on the web page, but it went through to the email, so that's wonderful that that worked. If you have any more questions, I'll just leave it a few more minutes. Make sure to pop them in the chat box there and I'll get to you. Luckily, we don't seem to have had the helicopters flying overhead. I'm just going to switch back from screen sharing to me. And there I am again, once you see me. Um, so if you need, do need to still grab that link, the replay of the uh, workshop will be posted so you can grab it from there and I'll put it in the link and everything like that but it's pianophysician.com slash awesome so if you want to grab those freebies hop over there okay I think 
everyone has had a chance to answer their questions. So I am just going to say goodbye now. I really hope you enjoyed the, the workshop today and had some fun. <laughs> this is off topic, but I love your bookshelves. I've just seen from Bravo Music Academy. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. It took a very long time to get the paint to stick to those because they're um, from Ikea, so they're that horrible plasticky surface and it was almost impossible to get them to go pink but they absolutely had to be pink and white in my opinion i needed some brightness in this little office space so <laughs> thanks for that um right so i am going to sign off now i hope you enjoyed my bookshelves and the workshop and got a lot out of it make sure to hop over to get that pdf download and to check the course out if you're interested in that and I hope to talk to you all soon. You can always find me at colorfulkeys.ie, my blog, and in the Vibrant Music Studio Teachers community on Facebook. So make sure to ask to join there. I'm happy to add anyone that teaches music of any sort. Thanks so much for watching and I'll talk to you all soon.